Fell in love with Ocala in the early 80s. My wife had been brought up here, moved our family up here in 1982. By 83, I was in the insurance business, which kind of became a training ground of how to work with people. And through that, I felt the call of God to preach. At that point, God opened a door for us to become youth pastors at a mega church in Orlando. When my husband first came to me and let me know that he felt called to be in the ministry and he felt called to be a pastor, my initial reaction was, I think you married the wrong woman because I can't play the piano and I can't sing. And that was really my total concept of what that role would be for me, that I needed those requirements met. My husband came home from one of the services at Orlando Christian Center and he sat up on the platform as one of the pastors. And he told me that while we were sitting there in the service, I saw a light, like a light over this couple. I saw this young couple named Chris and Bonnie Hayes. I really didn't even know that was her name at the time. But I felt like the Spirit of God put in my heart that that couple will be a blessing to your life and you'll be a blessing to theirs. The first time we met the pair and chiefs was truly a God moment. And we didn't realize how profound that moment was in being able to really just change the whole trajectory of our lives. And we're so grateful that God led us to be together with them. Early 1990, we really felt the call of God back to Ocala to start a regional type of church. We were looking for a name, and that's where we got the founding scripture, John 6, 63. The words that I speak unto you, Jesus said, are spirit and life. And that was our founding text. Well, I know that at first, you know, we tried to argue a little bit with God of saying, well, uh, God, are you sure, do, are you aware that there's over 450 churches in Marion County? And, uh, and God just kept really putting in our hearts that we were going to be different, that He wanted us to be different. And one of the things, especially from growing up here, I knew there was a lot of religion that we were going to deal with. Because of my background in the insurance business, having dealt with mostly African-American people in the community, it really gave me uh, an instant desire as we started our church to, to really found it upon some precepts and principles that would break through that that racial barrier, that color barrier that kind of separated a lot of the churches in the North Central Florida area. The first location that we had for Spirit Life Church was in a previous lawnmower shop. Uh, it was just a small warehouse building. Part of it was sanctuary. The other half was unair conditioned space that we used for children's ministry. Well, right at the beginning, we had exactly 70 people to announce the vision to and it kind of took on a life of its own. You know, uh, we were just starting, but that number 70 was such a scriptural number that it gave us confidence to know that God was with us. By the third Sunday, we had a friend that came in who was an internationally known author and Christian speaker and had over 200, and we blew out the air conditioning the third Sunday. Well, we started with a real strong vision and knew pretty much what God called us to do which gave us a laser-like focus, but really made us, we we're very strong in prayer, very strong in prayer and laying the foundation of the rest of what we've become. We knew that God put things in our heart that He saw for the vision of this house and, and this city, and, and we knew that it would take prayer to get us there. The early days we were pioneering in every true sense of the word. We were fighting for our right to exist as a church. The, the core principles had to do with breaking through the racial barrier, uh, building a strong praying church, and really helping to raise up the next generation. I think with everybody, there's a handful of times when there's something so significant in your life that's gonna change the rest of the course of your life. And that's what it was like for me when I met the parent chiefs. We had been praying for years for God to bring a worship leader to us. We actually started the church with CDs and, and if many of you remember cassette tapes, well, we use those uh, for our praise and worship time. And it, it, God really blessed that, but we knew that it was not His best, what He had for us. And we knew as we were moving forward that God had somebody there to take that spot. And at that point, the Lord gave me a strong unction where I knew that I knew that God was saying, I'm going to raise you up a psalmist and you're to wait for Him. So at that point, I said to, to, to my wife, I really feel like it's a guy, God's raising him up, and he's a psalmist, which to me meant he would carry the, the vision and the impact of the house into music. I was guest 
worship leading for a friend of mine in the Kissimmee St. Cloud area. It was the first time I'd ever led worship and it was a, it was a new experience for me. And when we went into that place, a young man named Lindsey Seals was leading the praise and worship and my friend looked at me and said, who's that guy? And I just felt the Spirit of God on me so strong. I said, I don't know who that is, but I think he's mine. I think he may be our praise and worship leader. He invited him to come and, and sing in our church. And when he came, there wasn't a dry eye in the house as he began to worship God. He began to play the keyboard and he began to sing, let your glory fill this house. And the glory of God definitely did. And it still does every time that man leads us in worship. I presented to him where we'd come from, where we were, where we were going as a church, and asked him if he'd like to be part of the team. And it's one of those times where I know that God just so clearly spoke to me that this was a, a yes. Cut to 20 plus years later, I'm here, and I know that this is where God has called me to be. Welcome to Trinidad Invasion. We're 36 people on our way to the nation of Trinidad and Tobago and the West Indies. Our Heart for Nations started in Trinidad. It was our first missions trip that we took during the first year of the church. 25% of the membership went on the first missions trip, and I knew right away that that had to be supernatural. I watched the people just come alive. I watched their gifts. I watched a boldness come on them because they were out of their comfort zone. They were out of their ordinary everyday life where people knew them. The awesome thing is, is not only do we get to go change lives and be used as God's vessels in that way, but we get to go be changed. A lot of times people will say, well, there's so much to do in your own backyard, right there in your own city. But I think what they can miss is the fact that when you get outside of your territory and you see the world for what it is, it makes everything so much smaller. I've had the privilege of preaching the gospel now in 67 different countries in virtually every continent on the planet except for Antarctica. It's been a great joy, and it seems to be something that really fuels the vision here at home. Instead of taking away from it, it really expands our vision right here in North Central Florida. A lot of times it seems like God's not answering our prayers because our faith is so set and we know God wants to do something. But the thing is, He doesn't answer the way we think so because He's got bigger and better for us. And that is exactly the story of how we got here where we are today. We've gone through so many different stages. We tried different pre-existing buildings that we looked at. And I remember going to places and praying over what could be the sanctuary and the office space and so on. And so God just took us on this great journey. God, in his miraculous way, opened up 24 acres of land right on the major highway, connecting North and South Florida, three major highways going right by us on this property. The bank told us for a few months we could get financing and then turned us down at the last minute but we didn't know how we were gonna get the land. It really felt like, God, either we walk away from that 24 acres now, or you need to do something. Pastor Richard came into my office one day and uh, grabbed me, and we went out, jumped in his car, and we drove down, and we got to the land, and we jumped the fence and trespassed on this land to, uh, to jump over the fence and pray. And coming out in the middle of this field where we realized that the only thing out here was cows and bees. When we realized it was cows and bees, I said, wait a second, that's milk and honey, that's our promised land. And as soon as we did that, all of a sudden the heavens opened and the rain poured down on us. I mean, we got soaked. A few days later, we found a great scripture in Psalm 68 that said that the heavens opened, the rain poured down, and whereby God confirmed his inheritance. Two weeks later, God opened the door, the owner of the land decided to hold the financing for us, and we began a process and bought the land that year. We 
keep this building and all this property here under Father God. We always knew that we would go on television. We had Ricky and Ryan, uh, our guys that are still with us, to found the TV team and the media team here, and it became a great big part of what God has done at Spirit Life Church. My best friend Ryan and I started the TV ministry from scratch right after we graduated Bible college together. And we didn't know what we were doing, but uh, God gave us the ability and we began to thrive. We started locally on our ABC affiliate, WCJB, for Gainesville and Ocala. And we had incredible ratings actually a short time after we started where we ended up beating Dr. Phil and Oprah and the NBA playoffs. And uh, just unheard of for a church to have a 71% market share, meaning that three out of every four TVs were tuned in our program. Later we added the Super Channel in Orlando and covered almost half the state. And then after that, with our friends in Iceland on satellite, we were able to reach almost 80 countries with our program. One of the highlights of my life was to be honored by my peers in the National Television Academy, where I was able to win two Emmy Awards one for our television program, Spirit Life Now, and another one for the Life Dome presentation we created. After being on the air nine years, we knew it was time for a transition. I knew that analog was about to be extinct and that our equipment was about to be worthless. So I kind of consulted my dad and said, listen, I think we should really sell our equipment now and wait till we can afford to upgrade to high definition. The whole process of the Life Dome was really, truly a miracle uh, because it's the best thing that we never did. We had a plan. We spent years in development, in engineering, in architecture, in site work. All of this work that we were doing to prepare to construct the Life Dome, all of that we were raising money and we were paying as we go. We had built it up to the point where it was debt free. We had all of the underground utilities completely done, all architecture paid for. But in April of 2007, the bank came through finally, and after years of no or not yet, the bank came and said, here's the money. By that time, our costs had escalated from $1.8 million on the first drawing board to probably about an $8 million building that we really couldn't afford. The moment they said yes, and I didn't have to fight for it anymore, I took it back to God and said, Lord, it doesn't feel right to me. I've taught people to live by the principle of the peace of God, and I don't have peace anymore, not just because of the price tag, but I don't have peace in my heart. When my husband came in the room after it was supposed to be a time of celebration, I knew that he was going to be signing papers to see a dream that we've been believing for and preparing for for years. And he just told me I couldn't do it. And I, I said, what are you talking about? He said, I got to where it was time to sign on the dotted line. And he said, I couldn't do it. I didn't have peace. Pastor Richard went through, I think one of the, probably one of the most stressful, high pressure times of his entire life. And he had to make a decision. And I, my respect for him has always been great, but I mean, it grew exponentially during that time because he wasn't willing to put the burden of debt on a congregation of people. He wasn't willing to let his ego or whatever it was about what people would have thought or what their opinions might have been about it. He wasn't willing to do that. And he allowed God, he made a hard decision for us to not go forward with the Life Dome, but it turned out to be one of the greatest things we could have ever done. Right after the fact, even though it made no sense at the moment, months after, just within months, the economy began to change. The whole economy, nationally and even internationally, took a downturn. Uh, we had many of our people that had career changes, massive career changes, and, and as the rest of the world went through a financial adjustment, we went through an adjustment as well too. I've got many friends, I'm talking about close friends, who've had churches foreclosed on, who have lost buildings, who have lost ministries, because for whatever reason, 
they move forward in maybe different projects or whatever, and then couldn't keep up with the debt service and all those things. So I look back on that and I just say, thank God that we waited for his timing. And again, when you can't see in the middle of it, there's something great that's coming at the end. I was probably looking a little bit too much to the next building to redefine us and set us into our community. And what God wanted to do, he had other plans. He wanted to redefine us in his own way as a soul winning church. One of the greatest helps to us has been Steve and Sharon Kelly, our pastor friends up in Wave Church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. They really helped us in our crossing over season to see the direction that God had really called us to move. I remember just being aware of walking into a service of Wave Church and feeling like, when did we get old and when did we get so religious? And especially when we knew God had called us to change the religious atmosphere of this area for us to actually have kind of had that creep into our environment, it really was a wake up for us. So in the life I think of every ministry, you're gonna to come to a crossroads and you're gonna to come to a place where you have to decide, are you gonna move forward or are you gonna stay where you are? We were about 16-ish years old and we'd gotten really, really good at taking care of each other and sort of being very internal and making sure that people were happy and weren't leaving and doing whatever. But I think God was challenging us to do what the Great Commission is, which is to look outside of your four walls and your stuff and really begin to think about others. If we could get them here, if we could have our people begin to change the culture of the house to bring their friends, to bring their unchurched, unreached friends and neighbors into our church, that would enable us to grow and reach the new generation we were so desperately trying to reach according to the original vision. We kind of had to take some moments where we, we had to ask ourselves some hard questions about redefining how the worship service was, would be and just get rid of some of the cringe factors. If what we're doing as a church is creating a culture that only church people understand, uh, if our terminology doesn't translate well to the rest of our work week, then we've missed the mark. You have to be willing to make sure that you're hearing what God is saying in this season right now so you can move into what he wants to do for your future. One of the great mentors in our lives in the 90s was Dr. Lester Sumrall, who was here three times and preached for us in, into his 70s and 80s before he passed away. One of the things that Brother Sumrall said to me and my wife one time that was so powerful, he said, build everything for the young and get the older people to pay for it. Reaching the next generation is a big part of my calling and destiny, and it always will be. It's not about just having reaching the first next generation we had back in the early 90s and then growing old together with them. It's always about reaching that next generation of children and teens and preteens, youth and young adults that are going to shape their world and help us to change it. We love pouring into the next generation because we know that they are the future of this church and where we're going and where we're headed. And we've uh, tailored everything to reach the next generation because we've grown up in a in a time where they've never stepped foot into church before and this might be their first experience. We have such a passion just to see the next generation, you know, have uh, their own relationship with God and not to have to uh, piggyback on their parents or anybody else's relationship with God, but to really experience God for themselves. A few years ago when we chose not to build the Life Dome, we focused our financial resource then we had raised into the next generation. There's been an excitement here the past few years as we've upgraded and remodeled a lot of our facilities, including our nursery, our preschool, our children's and youth facilities, our restrooms, and most recently, our Raise the Roof campaign, where we converted our sanctuary into a first-class auditorium and a concert hall with 7.1 surround sound and a giant high-definition screen. All of these different projects we've approached on a pay-as-we-go basis to keep us debt-free and keep us financially strong as a church. I want to talk to my friend Jim Knight, who used to be with Hard Rock Cafes and is now an internationally known uh, conference and motivational speaker. And just ask Jim, 
what he thought about branding and what he thought about our church and come in. So he came in one Sunday last August of 2012 and kind of just, I didn't tell anybody he was here. I just let him come in and kind of experience what it was like. And I just wanted to see uh, how our culture had shifted and some things we maybe still needed to change. One of the things he said to me was, you know what, I felt like the, the, that your brand name, Spirit Life Church, he said, brand names make a promise. He said, when I came into the church, I felt like it didn't match the brand name that was on the sign. There was something different. And so he asked me, would you be willing to maybe do something different? From that point on, and, and our staff began to talk about our real mission to be a relevant, creative church empowering people to reach others. But in order to reach people that are different from us, maybe we had to rethink the name of the church for where we really are. When my dad first came to me and talked about a name change, it was years and years ago, and my sister and I were pretty much against it. And we just knew that we had a brand of Spirit Life Church, and we owned spiritlife.com, and we had a following. And I realized over the years that the name Spirit Life was kind of getting old. You know, the word spirit in our generation, in our culture, kind of sounds spooky. God gave me a great scripture in the book of Isaiah where the word says, I am the Lord your God, I will call you by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And I want to make sure that we're always respecting our heritage as Spirit Life Church. I don't ever question the name we've had. But one of the things that really hit me strong when God spoke and confirmed that he was going to rename us was that it had to be both timely and timeless. We took it to prayer mainly. We, we researched, we brainstormed, we worked really hard on it. And even when we tried to think of even trendy names or, or things like that, it just didn't have staying power. You know, we want to be relevant for forever. We don't want to be a fad or, you know, a passing trend. And finally, one night after several weeks of searching, I was just thinking about certain things and all of a sudden it hit me. And I was so excited that we found something so simple and so us at the same time. We've been working for over a year on the legal side of the name change, including the trademark and copywriting and the website domain that we have acquired. It's amazing when God gives you the right word and the right thing that just perfectly describes us and who we are and also where we're headed.
this name change is not the announcement of more change. It's simply a, a capsulizing of what God has already done in us. When you start thinking about what now means, it's a word that's gonna last forever. And in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, there's gonna be a relevance of what God is doing right then, right now, in that season. Now church, it's such a simple word and yet it's packed with power. There's so much in it. You know, we recently heard a guest speaker say, simplify to strengthen. And I really believe that that's what God's doing with us. And He is simplifying us to strengthen us and to carry us into the next season of great things that He has in store. As Now Church, we are more prepared for growth than ever before. I see amazing things ahead financially and numerically and just our influence around the world as we do live streaming. Just the thought of being able to stream our services live online or on demand whenever people want on their iPads or on their iPhones or on their computers, it's just really cool. We're going to be able to reach a whole new generation of people and really there's no boundaries. I see the next generation carrying the torch. I see God multiplying this house, not just in numbers, but in influence. Um, I see records, I see recordings, I see traveling. There's just so much that the future holds. And I think it's been in part because we've been obedient and faithful with what God has given us. We've been faithful with the small. And I believe that as we come into this next season, we're about to be entrusted with a whole lot more. We feel like we're right on the edge, right on the precipice of an amazing breakthrough as a church. We feel it in everything that we're doing. We feel it in our worship. We feel it in our children's ministry, our youth ministry. We feel it in the preaching of the word here. We feel that God is just about to break us into a whole new dimension. The mission of Now Church is to build a relevant, creative church, empowering people to reach others. That's who we've become over the last few years anyway. And I tell you, the best days are just ahead of us. We've got a new lobby on the horizon. We've got new buildings on the horizon. All kinds of things happening with our school, education. All these things are ahead as we build bridges to the lost and reach people right where they are now. Come be a part of something where God is moving, where God is, where it's not about what God did, but it's about what God is about to do. The future is now.